So, Alexander, hi. hi. And welcome to our university. Thanks for Stefan having me. Stefan University. How do you like it here? I really like it. I mean, the weather is not that bad it's in the south. Uh, that's the first one. Second, the campus is great. And I've seen many awesome people around. So. Thank you for joining us and uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. And um, so, let's go to work, no? Yeah. So, if it were to give a definition to research, when you were at the beginning of your work, what would it be? And how would you define research now, after you published numerous articles and made the academic world richer? Okay, I would not name it numerous, but I published a few, but anyway. I don't feel that my definition of research is changing like that much over time. In my non-textbook explanation, that is like finding some new information about the world around us, about, in my case, human health, and all of that in the way to help humans to overcome certain conditions or diseases, in my very applicable case. I think overall research is quite great and a huge topic to define uh, that can be finding new insights about the world's functioning, about the nature, Maybe this is in a broad context, but it didn't really change through my work time. I, I, I kind of stick to this definition before. What age were you when you decided that you want to become a researcher? It's tough to say. I mean, it was my third year of medical studies. So in, in Ukraine, we have the first three years like pre-medical topics like physiology, histology, pharmacology. And it was so fun. And I felt it's a very important topic and there are many unknown things. Mm -hmm. And around that, I just, at the time, I decided that, well, it might be worth to you know pursue this path and eventually it led me here so i would say around 10 11 years ago oh that's nice yeah. okay so you have like a decade of research work uh, congratulations say, say a decade of inspiration to make research and a little bit less than half a decade or no, actually half a decade of doing actual research work in a lab yeah okay so how is innovation born what do you think and what is your motivation that keeps you doing the good job Okay, so first of all, the innovation, I think, is the like, chaotic process. You cannot really push it, you cannot force people to innovation in something that is being born in like a free environment, a very open environment where you can talk to other people, see what works, what doesn't, and experiment, like, you know, the, the, the crown thing that we're all doing here and, and elsewhere. So I think innovation is being born when people recognizing some unmet need, should it be a new type of drug, a new medical device or whatever. And they're trying to find or figure out a creative way to fill this need with something that nobody did before. Mm -hmm. um, in my case, innovation is something I can relate to in my publications, for example, in my studies. This is again, some using of some computational algorithms or, ex or experiments that were not tried before and some of them were successful. And this is how it brought me to some innovation in a new ways how to do things. Yeah, so. In one of the approaches, for example, we used machine learning based on very simple laboratory-based parameters of patients with compensated cirrhosis to predict the portal pressure, an important like, clinical readout. And this is something nobody did before, or at least in the scale that we tried to do that. Uh, perhaps it comes as close to the innovation question. Yeah, as yeah that's right. That's actually the definition of innovation. Thank you. So, um, what is the main reason you chose this domain and not something else? Right. So, as a medical doctor, I was really, really interested in doing research in a field applied to human health. Should it be micromedicine or whatever? Right now, I would define probably my field as like systems biology, meaning that linking complex physiological molecular processes with each other, seeing like how they interact, interplay. Uh, what brought me here, I think, just my passion to you know find new things about human disease, about human health, and at a certain point try to you know find some better therapeutic options for patients, and that's what that's why I'm here, Bench. Oh, that's that's really nice. So, um, how do you find Coach USV Project, a new center that is financed by the National Recovery and the Resilience Plan, that comes to support the researchers and promote research through young students? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very important to involve young people, like young professionals or young students, to research because, at least in my experience, this is a lacking point. Like we didn't have too many of hands-on experience in the lab settings as a medical doctor, even, even those who were willing to do that. And I think if you have a national program for that in Romania, it's, it's very important. And, you know, the more people who are interested in science are able to, to try themselves in this environment, the more good scientists you will eventually have, because, you know, they will find out, do they like it, do they not like it, and 
you know. So I think it's great that you're doing that. I hope it will, you know, be successful and result in something good. We also hope that. And here comes the, the next question. Is it worth it to be a researcher? Mm, it's passion. It's something where you, as a researcher, and what I see from many colleagues and myself, mm -hmm. you cannot really switch your mind after, you know, finishing the work day, you're going through the campus in a subway, and you're still thinking about something that you could do additionally. I think this is a way of living, like you, all your life is linked to that. Not necessarily it's a good point, but you know, this is how it works. And this is why I think it happens. Yeah, and here comes the next question. How do you find the balance between the work you do and the free time, the hobbies, the family life? I'm not very good in finding this balance and neither many of my colleagues, unfortunately, who I know. Um, like my hobbies, I believe in the like past years become less and less less priority. Um, even though I had some, uh, like my family supports me, so they understand that even though it's not the best balanced work mm -hmm. in the world, it's still an important job, so they do their best. Yeah, and like work is everything else. <laughs> Sometimes we have out of office Zoom calls because the project is important and we have to prepare something like emergently. Yes. Sometimes we have patient sample arriving in out of office hours. And in my case, one of my studies, for example, is in rare disease, rare liver diseases, where I just cannot, cannot miss the opportunity because it's like so rare. And there might be a few hundreds of patients in whole all chamber I work. So yeah, but I mean, it works somehow, could be better, hopefully becomes better at certain yeah, point. This is one of our objectives of our project to support researchers in order to find the balance between uh, the work they do, the important work and also the important work they do at home. You see, in, in the perfect world, it will be just as any other job, meaning that it will be more balanced and you would not see this pressure that if you don't publish this year, even if as a good scientist, it's like you will not get a grant, you will not get a contract prolongation. So a little bit more job security, maybe revised approach for grant funding agencies, how they see that, you know, the potential of a research group can help here. Otherwise, the environment is quite hostile for, for this healthy balance, I would say. Yeah, they just want you to produce more and more and more. Publish or perish. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So please choose one or two, three favorite studies, articles dear to you that you published and explain them a little bit in a common language so that everybody can understand what okay. is it you do. It's super simple because so far I have two papers I first or co-first altered and one more on the process I'm going. So the first one would be, which is close to my heart, is the study on the biomarkers of something which is called liver fibrosis. Um, how it's been developed, how it's been regressed. And why it's important because liver fibrosis is a condition, pathological condition occurring in a chronic liver disease when efficient regeneration is not anymore possible. And some damaging agents, right, let's say alcohol, hepatitis C virus or, or, or hepatotoxic compounds, they damage the liver tissue and because it, it's a chronic damage, it cannot be replaced yes. or regenerated efficiently, it being replaced by fibrosis. Now, it's sometimes very easy to find out that by taking a biopsy, so basically taking the invasive way of mm -hmm. taking tissue from patients, studying that. And our idea was that there might be some genes which function we can study and see based on this gene function, maybe measuring that in a blood cells or, or wherever else, whether there is a fibrosis inside the liver, whether it's progressing, so meaning that the situation is worsening or improving, like patient in abstinence of alcohol or patient cured from hepatitis C. And this is the study where we've shown in several mouse models which marker which gene markers associated with these conditions, progression, regression of the fluid fibrosis. Eventually we came to human data and we confirmed which of the genes are also seem to be linked in a human setting. And what results have you got? So we got the, the number of genes uh, which were not previously connected to this processes in humans and in many more models, but most importantly in humans, which function is directly linked to the progression regression of fibrosis. Now, if you think about the next step, that would be making a prospective study with patients, for example, treat, being treated uh, treated from hepatitis C or, or from alcohol-related liver disease, and seeing whether these genes are really reflective of their dynamic process. Yeah. Um, as a side effect of this study, but an important one, we also found the genes which are regulating uh, or linked 
to the portal pressure. So this is a portal hypertension is an increased pressure in the portal vessel called portal vein, mm -hmm. which is a driver of all or many of the compensation scenarios like varicella bleeding, ascites, which are life threatening. And in this, in this regard, I found the genes and described some of them for the first time linked to these changes in the portal pressure. Potentially, they can be biomarkers or perhaps therapeutic targets, but it requires more evaluation. Uh, the second uh, this happened, uh, work I already briefly described, we used machine learning tools to use simple lab-based parameters that every general practitioner in the world can access, like bilirubin, platelets, a few more uh, liver, liver injury factors, uh, uh, bilirubin, and so on. Um, and uh, we provided a calculator for physicians, so physicians can just impute these parameters, go to the website and see the results. And what the result is showing is the percentage or um, percentage how, how uh, possible is that, that the patient has significant portal hypertension or, or, mm -hmm. or, or even worse portal hypertension. Um, and this was innovative in a way that we use machine learning for that inst instead of just usual statistical tests. And we were among the first ones to do that and publish this. And again, because of the accessibility, um, by this January, 15,000 unique users used our calculator based on the website statistics. So people seem to use that and it's something. Are they content with it? Uh, I mean, hard to say. I know that some of them are using the calculator in their own studies as perhaps yeah, an validation, validation of their own models or in addition to them. But yeah, and also shown that it's actually the same good in our cohort in Vienna as the current golden standard for non-invasive diagnosing, like liver stiffness measurement with ultrasound. Uh, similarly. Um, yeah, so this was the first, the second one. The third one is still being processed. I briefly talked about that at the school I'm attending right now here in Sochava. Uh, it's about rare liver disease called primary sclerosis and cholangitis. And it seems that we are doing great job so far showing which new molecular targets can be targeted in, in the cell communications of mm -hmm. the disease. Um, because it's a rare disease, nobody really knew that much about how the cells behave in yeah. the disease. Maybe there are like specific disease-linked mechanisms involved, and it appears so. Um, and like, consequently, consequently, there was no efficient therapy mm -hmm. for that. And we are you know, approaching to the step where we can show communities rather soon that here are the new core targets and here are the compounds act on these targets. So, yeah. yeah, these are the three works which are close to my heart and oh, I really enjoy right. that, That's really important work that you do and very interesting. Congratulations Thank for you. everything that you do Thank and you. hope for the future to, to come up with more. Thank you. But uh, keeping a balanced uh, work life. <laughs> I really wished. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, how do you find Romanian research compared yeah. to uh, Germany, no? Austria. Austria, so, yeah. Sorry. So here I think I'm a little bit more knowledgeable than the average attendant of the school because I've been in Romania a few times already. Mm -hmm. For the first time in my life in Bucharest, actually for the research internship in, um, uh, in, in the Bucharest Emergency Hospital where we studied and, and did some molecular genetics and then the Victor Babich Institute for Genetics uh, where we also did a few experiments. And that was interesting because you've seen compared to Ukraine, how much the institutions here are integrated in the EU funding programs. Yeah. Uh, the researchers are mobile, they are exchanging with their colleagues, other researchers coming to Romania to work here. So this was something very interesting for me and I noted that um, a few more times, like the next time I visited Romania actually for bioinformatics training because there was a strong community of bioinformaticians in Bucharest. They were using this uh, in their research projects, in their companies, and, and they just shared this knowledge. So I think like Romania has great potential here and it's something we Ukrainians can learn from or maybe exchange with some ideas. And I think this is like, I, I, I don't know how it was before, like in, in 10, 20, 30 years before ago, but nowadays I think you have all the potential to publish great, great publications like Q1 journals um, and at least cooperate with many facilities like which we're having here in the EU and which can provide you with the best technologies thanks to the EU mm. funds. So. Yeah, the mobility we're talking about, mm. was it useful to you personally? Oh yes, uh, I think that was one of the defining points in me getting a PhD position just because as a medical doctor like you don't have many scientific training like per se, like hands-on. And in my case it helped me to actually get some skills in flow cytometry, some echogenetics, some data analysis methods and yeah, eventually I think it, you know, convinced people that, okay, so this person perhaps can work in the lab. 
that's that's great yeah what uh, advice would you give our young senior and senior researchers who are interested in medicine in medicine yes now uh, you can uh, tell them okay so i consider myself a young researcher anyway <laughs> so i will try just to reflect on that i think it's very important even though the world is chaotic and, and, and there is a time issues and the work-life balance which you discussed, it's important to still find a certain way to balance just for your own mental health, you know, and maintaining healthy relations with surrounding friends, families. Um, there will be failures and I had a lot of failures in my experiments and this is the part of the journey. Some people react very painfully for that and I'm super sorry if some superiors, like supervisors, react painfully for that because it was never a case in my journey so far. And I'm happy for that because I just accepted that failures is the past of the pro a part of the process and it will happen. And for the senior researchers, I mean, not being senior myself, I can only think of some wishes and communication experience. I think it's being able to, to see others, not as, you know, units in your department or a lab, but real human beings with their interests really investing in their training and supervision and sharing the knowledge without any prejudice or or thinking that you know they are not as good because it's obvious you're a senior they are never as good when they're junior researchers yeah that's my idea thank you what are your plans concerning your research and the collaboration with stefan chelmari university so far actually that's a very like question I was thinking about. Uh, perhaps in my own research, it's on the concluding stage right now, so I'm finishing my PhD. Mm -hmm. There is not much place covered in these specific projects I'm working on. But also being a founding member of the Ukrainian bioinformatics community, which is called Genomics UA, uh, we see that here in this university, there is a very potent computational cluster infrastructure, and it seems like a willing to share the resources for contributions in scientific projects. And this is something, for example, we don't have in Ukraine, and we would be happy to cooperate on that and see maybe how we make, how we can perform some computational analysis together. Um, also for educational part, because it's always a great part of the of the process to involve some junior researchers so they see how it works in real life. Um, this is one of them. Second, I mean, the overall quality of the lectures was impressive, and I see that. You know, the university tries to attract such events as the school, uh, the school is here. So I can totally imagine that there will be a possibility for us to discuss some specific scientific ideas, maybe apply for common grants, something like that. So, that would be great mm. having you here and yeah. um, to collaborate with you. Yeah. yeah same. And um, that's all for now. Thank you um, very much for your time. I know time is really <laughs> short. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me. And, um, we hope to see you again. Hopefully I'll be here soon again. Thank you. Thank you.